Hello, welcome to this Program for Cultural Heritage demo video. Today we're going to be trying to extract data from Wikidata using Python. And so we're not going to delve too much into what Wikidata is or kind of the, the nitty gritty details of it, uh, but we are going to kind of look at how you would interact with it using Python. So you probably um, have, you know, if, if you're watching this video, you probably know what Wikidata is. And you probably maybe even you know edited it and contributed to it via the website. You may even have um, queried it using the Sparkle endpoints. And maybe now you're at the point where you'd like to do something with the data, but you want to do it you know automated or you want to do it programmatically. So you want to use a programming language to interact with Wikidata to pull out data that you're interested in. And so you know this is different from just writing the Sparkle query and downloading the results. You're actually writing a program that does the Sparkle query or other um, interactions with Wikidata to do something with the data. So that's kind of the goal of this um, video. We're going to look at a couple different ways of doing this um, because there's just a couple different ways of doing it on Wikidata. Um, so Wikidata has a Sparkle endpoint, as I just mentioned, and so you can interact with that Sparkle endpoint with your Python program. Um, but Wikidata also has a, some API endpoints and kind of some special data pages endpoints that you can also interact with. So we're going to spend some time looking at how to interact with a Sparkle endpoint with um, Python, and then we'll look how you could like download data for a specific entity um, using these special data endpoints. So to get started, um, we are going to head over to the Sparkle interface on the website just to get a, a kind of settled with that. Um, so of course, this is at query.wikidata.org. And you know you run your your Sparkle query here, which is like you know we're not going to get too deep into the Sparkle formatting Sparkle queries because that's a whole other topic. Um, that's definitely a different kind of talk you should, uh, if you're interested in the nitty gritty of Sparkle, get into. But they have some examples here of Sparkle queries preformed that you can use. So for example, this first one here is um, cats. And so let me make this bigger. So we can walk through this just to understand what's going on here. So this first one is basically opening the the, the query, saying, "Okay, I want to I want you to return these two items, the variable item and the variable item label," and then it's basically giving you the criteria for matching these variables. So it says the item. So this is just a variable. So the first part of the of the triple or, or of the query should say this is a variable, and then there should be a property of p31. And so in Wikidata, p31 is the instance of. So this is basically the type of entity that it is. And then the last piece is that it should be this instance of the specific type of Wikidata item. And then this last piece here is just basically the special thing that's just returning this item label. And so it's just kind of like a, it's a little helper that's adding the textual labels to your query. So basically, if we kind of see the hover of this uh, query, it's saying find all the instance of, find all the things for the instance of is house cat. PQ146 is house cat. So if we run this, we'd see that we get a bunch of results. And then, you know, if we went into one of these house cats, we'd see that, yep, they're an instance of house cats. You know, they have an image of them. They have some other metadata about it. Some of them have more than others, right? So this is not like a consistent database. This is just like a crowdsource, you know, data effort. So it, it really depends on what fields are populated based on whoever created this record, whoever updated it, et cetera. So this is an award-winning cat, apparently. And so you would, you know, there's a lot more information about it than some of the other ones. It's also an actor, a famous cat. All right, so we can see this. This is a basic kind of super simple query, but this is the kind of query that you might want to automate using Python, right? You, you would probably come in, come in here and change these, and we'll do that next. But just basically, how do you get this data that's in this web page into your program? That's like the first step, right? And so, of course, there is um, kind of standardized um, or best practices of how these queries are formed and communicated to the server. So all we need to do is kind of replicate this interface, but do it in Python, and then we can get access to the data. So the first thing we need to know is like, all right, when I push this play button, it's sending this request to somewhere, right? And it's returning the results. So just to get the URL of where it's sending it, we can look in our developers tools. So if you go to, you know, uh, in your browser, you go to tools and go to developer tools. It opens up this interface and you can go to the network tab. And when you hit play, you'll see the request being sent. 
And so the request is being sent to a um, specific site. So it's query.wikidata.org slash sparkle. And then there's a parameter saying query, and then it, it looks like a URL encodes the sparkle uh, query that we just um, had in the editor text editor interface. So basically we need to replicate this this request. And so if we, you know if we went to this address in our browser, something would probably happen. And it downloaded this um, file, the Sparkle file. So it kind of sends the results back to you. So let's um, let's try to um, replicate this in our uh, Python environment and try to get it just to do this query and send back the Sparkle data and see what it looks like. So I'm going to go to my um, terminal here. And I'm going to Go to my downloads. I'm going to make a directory called the Wikidata test. Change directory into Wikidata test. And I'm going to um, Sublime. So I'm, I'm going to create a new file, or we can just go over to Sublime and do it that way. So I'm in here in Sublime. So I'm going to make a new Python file. I'm going to save it in that directory as. Um, Sparkle. All right, so we know that we're going to do some interactions with the website, so we know we need to import the request library. So there's a whole video on working with the request library if you haven't used it before, but you do need to have it installed this module. So there's a, a lecture talking about that. Um, plus. And then we need to. Um, basically define a few things, right? So we need to define the URL that we want to go to, and we need to define the parameters we want to pass to that URL, and then we need to initiate the request. So if we go back to the website, we can see that we have all those pieces here. So we know that the URL is this, basically this first part, and then the parameter is the query, is, is the name query, and then it has a Sparkle query uh, encoded in there. So we can replicate this in, in request pretty easily. So we'll define the URL and say this is the URL. And then we're going to define our parameters um, and make those a, a dictionary. And the only parameter it has is query. And then this is where our Sparkle would go. So the Sparkle kind of, as you can see, is multi-lined. And it's kind of, um, you know, there's line breaks. And there's it's, it's its own kind of query language. And so it would be kind of messy to store it like this, you know, like select blah, 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 from, right, and have it all in one line. It's a little hard to edit. So what you can do is, let's let's put this in a, a variable for now and um, define it up here. So in in, in Python, we we know there's, there's a, a couple different types of strings, right? There's normal strings like this, single quotes, normal strings like this, the double quotes. We even talked a little bit about special strings, things that are like regular expression strings, so they know it's a regular expression inside. We talked about F strings, where you can kind of slot in a variable here. It kind of just plops in the data into that string. And there's also another type of multi-line strings that you can have actually line breaks and stuff like that. So these um, strings uh, start with th uh, three quotes. And then at wherever you want it to stop, you end up with three quotes. So all of this real estate here is all part of the string. And so that actually allows you to have multi-line strings. And you could put something like a Wikidata query in there and that make it look like you would see it in the editor. So let's look at the, um, let's steal this um, cat's query. And we'll just put it into our Sparkle variable. All right, so now this we could even indent it if we wanted to, but it doesn't it doesn't care about indentation inside these triple quotes. It's fine. All right, so the fact that we're passing it into this parm parms and we're going to send it into um, request with it as an argument into the uh, params, it will automatically encode this. So um, you can see in the request that it's like this bunch of gibberish, and then sometimes you see a keyword that you recognize. Basically, it takes a string and it escapes all the stuff that can't does not allow to belong in a URL. And so things are like line breaks, things like spaces, things like special characters like colons. Like these are all encoded into these special characters um, sequences. 
so that this this the string can end up on the server and the server can decode it and then know exact see exactly the same thing. It's just a, basically a way of passing data through a URL into a server. So for us, we're lucky because request just take takes care of all of that for us and we don't have to worry about it. All right, so it happens kind of behind the scenes. So we know that we have our URL, our parameters, and we're set to go, right? So we'll say r equals request.get. This is a get request. We're going to hit this URL. And we're going to ask, uh, we're going to send these parameters over to it, our dictionary. And let's just print the results of what it does. Print uh, r.text. The results are stored in the text attribute property. All right, so let's go see if this works. So in the Python 3. Uh, sparkle.ui. All right, so it returns some data. You can see this here, lots of data. And so we can come in here and see if we can see one of these cats' names, right? So these look pretty familiar names. These are the cats that we saw in the results. But you'll notice that this format is what? It's XML, right? So the basically, this endpoint is just saying, here's your data. It's in XML because that's just the way that the service is written to, to communicate with you. And so that's fine, right? We you could actually, if you wanted to work with XML, you could totally interpret this and load up your X tree and start parsing it. Um, we've been a little bit more familiar working with JSON in this these lectures, so we're going to want it to work with this in JSON. And so, luckily, the server uh, that's running this endpoint, the Sparkle endpoint, knows how to convert uh, any results you want into Spark into JSON before it sends it back to you. And so, basically, we just need to say, "Hey, server, don't send this in XML." because we didn't tell you how to send it, but please send it in JSON instead. And so the way we do that is with a, um, a feature of web requests, making requests on the internet or with HTTP called content negotiation. And content negotiation basically says, hey, server, you know, I'm really looking for this content in this specific format. So most of the time when you're using the, the web, your browser is sending this um, content negotiation saying, Hey server, can you send me some HTML back? Because I'm a web browser and I'm really interested in HTML. So you could actually say different types of requests, right? So you could say, hey, actually, I'm interested in JSON, not HTML. So send this data back as JSON and not whatever you were going to send it as before. And it's this is not like a magic thing, right? It really depends on the server if it's it knows about that content type and is able to provide its content in that format. But uh, for us, for the Sparkle endpoint, it does know how to do that. So we just have to tell it to, hey, use this different content type. Um, so basically, we um, need to pass this request headers. And so headers are, you know, we talked about this before, but headers are these um, kind of almost invisible things that live inside of the requests that you make across the web, right? So if you look at here, here's the URL. Sorry, I'm opening up the web browser. I went back and made this request again. So here's the URL to the, the that this web browser is making. Then you can see this response headers. So these are the headers coming back. And then here are the, the headers I sent to it. And so you can see here, I'm sending it, asking it to send it as Sparkle results. And so um, that's the that's how this browser is sending it, asking for return results for it. Um, but we, we didn't do that. We, we're not putting the header in our request yet. So we can simply add that. And our request library module can, can support us to do that. So we just need to add it. So I'm going to define a new variable called headers, and I'm going to it's another dictionary, and the the um, the type of uh, header that we were going to send is the accept header. So the accept header, you basically put whatever kind of content you want it to return, right? So you could say like text HTML or XML application app XML if you want XML for this particular server and for this. Um, the type mime type we we ask for application um json and it knows how to interpret that request and it will send back the results as json so we just need to pass this headers into our requests like we did with our parameters and it, let's see the results Right, so it's the same data, but now it is not an XML tree, it's a JSON uh, dictionary. So there's a dictionary with uh, two uh, main keys, head and results, and then there's a sub key called bindings, 
And this is a, a, um, a list of results. And each one of these dictionaries is one of the pieces of data back from the, um, from the um, server. So now we have the data in uh, JSON format. The only other thing we'd want to do just to be kind of good um, neighbors here is to add our user agent to this as well. So whenever you make a request on the web to an HTTP server, there's some sort of user agent attached to it, right? So if you went over to the website and we looked at our headers again, we'd see that our request headers has some sort of user agent associated with it. So here it is. It's saying, you know, it's a Mozilla 5.0 Apple WebKit, blah, 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 Chrome, Safari, et cetera. So it's, it's basically sending the, 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 the type of browser that it's being re uh, request is being generated on. So whenever we make a request using um, requests library, it puts in its own name as like the user um, agent. And that's totally fine, except um, it's kind of um, opaque to the server and server administrators about who's actually using, making these requests, because you can imagine if everyone doing this just put in didn't set their user agent then it would just look like request library and it's like who's who's doing this so i think there's actually a policy for using these sparkle endpoints that if you're not going to using the web interface that you should include a user agent so they can identify you um, so you don't need to put any kind of identification information but just kind of you're able to to kind of group your requests into a, a bucket right and say like, okay this user agent is using so many um, requests and if they start using like you know hundreds of thousands of requests every hour or something like that, we might want to like, stop them, right? So it's just a kind of a nice way to, to kind of organize yourself into a bucket for them so they know um, how much you're using. And I think there's even a policy that if you don't set a user agents or, or your user agent is not unique, then they might eventually you know, not want to request on your requests. So we'll just set our user agent and this could just be something as very simple as like my, um, my Wikidata username. That's my Wikipedia username. I will say user we can uh, this is Memler test script. All right. So it doesn't matter at all. That's just like a little unique identifier for this particular script that they would see that, oh, this is, you know, they could group all these requests into one bucket if they wanted to. So that's just kind of like being a nice, uh, nice net uh, citizen there. All right. So now we have um, basically a Sparkle query that we like. It sends data, it returns that data back and it returns it back as JSON. So we're pretty much set here. The only thing, we, you know, I don't want to get too far into like Sparkle syntax and stuff like that because that's a whole lecture to talk about that. But I do want to kind of just look at how you might make this a little bit more useful, right? Because you might, um, this is a pretty limited, just using the canned um, query, you might want to uh, improve something on this and we can just see how to do that. So say you wanted to do something with this data, but you wanted also to add some more data to this request. So if we go into one of these um, famous cats, you can see that there's these other properties that are given for these, um, uh, de de depending on what's populated for each entity. And so we can see for this one, it's actually an occupation is populated. Um, and so it says the occupation is actor. Um, and so what we could do is um, also ask for something else, like we'd ask for its occupation. So I just want to show you how you might add additional fields to this process, right? So occupation is stored in P106. So all we need to do is go back to our um, code. And, you know, we could also, it's, it's better to like do this in the, in the query window first before you write it, copy it into your code, because then you're kind of like, Kind of um, make sure it works right so if we're going to add something else we need to add another variable so we could add like um, just this is a variable so it doesn't matter what you call it um, so i'll call it uh, occupation and then we need to include it in our query so we're going to say okay and i also want you to return the item where the um a Wikidata property um, P106, I think it was, which is occupation. And then we just slot in our variable for that one. So it will return 
so this is kind of limiting it and it's also kind of limiting it but it's not really limiting it because it's mostly variables so it's going to be our item that has this pro so it has a p106 and that p106 will be returning occupation so if you run that we'd see that we now have um, an occupation com column populated and so these are various occupations that this cats have we also noticed the data set went down a great deal. So it was 100 something, 140 something, and it dropped down to 40. So that's because this is an, this is a kind of a, a, a limiting factor to the query. So the entity has to have a P106 defined for it to actually work. So we can get around that by um, wrapping this in an optional brackets. And again, this is just, this is not, you know, you'd have to kind of go through and learn Sparkle and to know this is possible, what's possible with Sparkle, but this is just kind of showing how you do it. All right, so now that there, it's an, an optional thing, we can see that we still have our other cats who are, um, I guess you could say unemployed, <laughs> but there uh, now has populated the ones, both of them, right? We're back up to the same number we were before. And so the last thing we want to do is that this is pretty uh, useless as an as a, piece of information, right? The uh, Wikidata Q number is fine if you want to do more with it, but we actually want the label too. So we simply ask the helper to actually add the label to this field by putting the variable name and then adding um, camel case label to it. All right, so then we have another column, occupation label, and it has all these uh, occupations for each cat. All right, so now that we know it works in, the, in this query interface, we copy it and go over to our code and just replace that with our code, what we have in there. And so now let's let's actually do this for real and do something with the data. So let's like um, let's let's print out let's like like let's aggregate all the occupations or something like that. Um, so we're going to be working with JSON now. So we need to import JSON module. And so now we need to turn this into data. So we'll say data equals JSON the loads and the r.text. So it's returning it. And so if we go um, back to the results that we saw in the beginning, when we ran our first request, we see that it is a dictionary. We see that it is, has a variable called head and results. Sorry. We see that it is a dictionary and we see that there's a head in the results. These are the first keys. And then there's a bindings key. So it would be variable name, head, or sorry, variable name, results, bindings, and then loop through that stuff. So let's um, we'll just copy this for our reference and we'll go back to our code. And so we're gonna wanna loop through this, right? So let's comment this out. So we're gonna say, okay, for uh, result in data, right? Because that's where the data is stored in after we return to JSON. But then the first key is results. Then the second key is bindings. And then this is where all the data lives. So let's just print out the a result for each one of these. All right, and so now it's printing out um, each item and so you can see that it has the, um, for one that's more padded out with data, you can see there's a couple keys here. It says XML lang. Here, let's drop this into the editor to see how it looks formatted. Format as JSON. Okay, so it doesn't, yeah, so it's not JSON, it's a, it's a Python string. So what we can do is actually we can print the print it as JSON with a little bit of formatting. We've done this before, right? So we're gonna JSON, we're gonna to um, we're gonna dump it out as a string. And we're gonna ask it to um, dent it a little bit. This goes inside the dump command. Yeah, like that. So let's look at the let's look at these actually formatted a little bit better. So each one of these is one of the entities, right? And so we can see that there's a bunch of keys, and these keys result or reflect the um, columns. And so basically, they reflect our labels, our variable labels that we give in the individual variables. 
So each there's an item which has the queue number, there's an item label that has the cat name, there's an occupation which has the, the occupation queue number, and then there's an occupation label that has the label name. So if we wanted to print out all the um, labels, we just need to reference that particular key in the in the dictionary. So let's print result occupation label. Oh, didn't work, All right? So let's double check how this is actually formatted. Let's turn this back on and try it again. All right, so we have, um, oh, right, it didn't work because some of these don't have occupations, right? So there's occupation label doesn't exist for this one. So we try to reference a key that did not, that did not exist. So of course it's gonna give us an error. So let's go back knowing that, that not all the data is gonna be there. So let's check it before we do something with it, right? So we'll say if occupation label is in the uh, result, then do this piece. So we're gonna check before we actually reference it. Right, and so the actual label is not just a string as you would expect. It's actually a little bit more complicated uh, data type because it has, you know, what if there's a different language, et cetera. So the, the actual value is stored in value. So we just need to reference that key of this dictionary. So companion label, occupation label, value. So um, you know you could do stuff with this. Um, you know this is this is not a big data set, so it won't be you know kind of um, very impressive. But you could you know make a total. You could test to see if you know if the results, um, if the label of the occupation is not in the our new little dictionary here, then we'll make it in there. set it equal to zero. And then the last thing we'll do is add one to it, plus equals one. So, and then we'll print out occupation totals at the end. So right, you can imagine if you had mm, hundreds of thousands of results, this might be a little bit more interesting. But you can see, you know, by far the most popular occupation for these cats are uh, internet celebrities. And it's a pretty long tale of burglars, astronauts, critics, as control workers is pretty high up there. All right. So um, this is kind of an example of how you would use um, Sparkle to get started to uh, working with Sparkle with Python to pull out data from the Sparkle endpoint. Uh, the other way of doing this is if you had maybe a bunch of Q numbers. So it could be a case where you actually have Q numbers and you're looking for a specific piece of data about them. Um, so you could um, use the Sparkle endpoint to pull out data like that. And I'll show you how to do that really quickly. Um, it's basically ju just another Sparkle um, example. So I'm going to um, copy Sparkle to another one, Sparkle uh, called Sparkle IDs. And so Sparkle IDs, we're going to, let's look at the interface here to get a sense of what I'm talking about. All right, so say you actually had a bunch of Q numbers like this. So this is a Q number, this is a Q number, and these Q numbers represent an entity in Wikidata. And you're actually interested in pulling back data for those specific pieces, those specific Q numbers. So maybe you had, you know, 10,000 Q numbers that you got out of another process and you want to pull out a piece of data for them um, specifically. So what you can do in Sparkle, and this is just knowing Sparkle syntax, is that there's a values um, uh, query and you could actually um, set the item to be equal to a certain Q number. So say we want to pull back information for paddles and we want to pull back information for Toppy. Let's do some with, with occupations. For Peter the second. 
and for Brigadier Broccoli. Right, so now these values, we're not querying for anything. We're saying like these are the key numbers that I want information on. And then basically all you need to do is put the um, what information you want to return. So let's see if this actually works. Yeah, so it works. And so basically we're not querying anymore. We're saying look up these specific things and pull back this specific occupation property. So these return the, the three things. One thing to be aware of though, if, if there's multiple um, top values for that property, for example, if this was P31, which means instance of, um, you might get multiple. So these are all instance of house cat, but if they had another instance of, of like animal, then you'd also have another row in the results. So you just have to be like uh, cognizant of that. that. There is a bunch of, you know, you could have multiple duplicate results in there because of just the way uh, Wikidata returns data. All right, let's say you had this. So let's translate this to our Python code. Again, so this is just a way to pull back data from um, Wikidata when you have a bunch of IDs only, right? So here's our, our query, that little hard code there. And uh, I'm just mo modifying what we did before. So pretty much everything is the same. Let's get rid of this at the bottom here. Pretty much everything is the same, but you know, you, you probably wouldn't want to hard code these in here in the query because you're gonna have some source of data that has all of them, right? Maybe you have a JSON file or something that has a list of 100 Q numbers. And so basically what we want to do is make the Sparkle query um, um, populated with those queue numbers. So what you could do is you could like re delete these and it's a little confusing because there's this bracket which reminds us of F strings, but this is not an F string. This is just a Sparkle query syntax that needs these brackets. So we could add a placeholder in here to call it like something like replace me, replace. Right, and so basically we could have, this is a static string, and then we could actually put in something into there and replace it with our queue numbers. So say I had a, a list of queue numbers here, and uh, these will be represented as strings, and um, maybe they, um, they probably wouldn't have the prefix. So there's usually a prefix WDQ, one number, 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 number. So these probably wouldn't have those if you're just getting them from somewhere else. They'll probably just be a Q and then a number. So let me go back and grab those numbers that I deleted. So I have this one, I have this one, and I have this one. All right, so the first thing we want to do is convert these into something that looks like um, this, right? With this list of Q numbers. And so we basically, we want to turn a list into basically a string of Q numbers separated by a space and maybe add these WDs to them first. So there's a number, you can do this in one line. You know, it might, it might be, it might make more sense if we kind of do this in a more verbose way like a very kind of like mm, extra steps but maybe it's all be a bit more clearer to it so let's let's make a new list called q numbers with prefix and that will be an empty list and so we're going to say for q in q numbers and then we're going to say q numbers with prefix dot append we're going to append um, an f string here with the wiki data prefix and then this is gonna be the Q number in there. So we're basically building another list with all these Q numbers, but with the prefix on there now, because you need that. So let's comment this stuff out and print this out, how it looks. All right, so Python 3 Sparkle IDs. All right, so now we have a list of key numbers with the actual wiki, wiki data prefix that's required for the Sparkle endpoint. So now all we need to do is combine them into this big string. 
So we, we don't need this to be a string or a list anymore. We need it to be a string. So we could say um, replace string equals. And in Python, you can join a list together by using these um, double quotes and say join. And inside of here, you put what you want, what the list you want to join into it. And so inside of here, you put whatever you want to be separating them. You know, So we want just a space to separate them. You know, We don't want a comma. That's just the syntax or sparkle is a space. So let's print this string and see if it looks right. Yeah, right, it's just a string with the Q numbers with their prefix and it's ready to go. So let's, last thing we need to do is slot this replacement string into this spot where it's saying replace me. So then we'll just do it this, we'll say sparkle equals sparkle dot replace. We're going to be looking for the string replace me with these brackets. And then we're going to replace it with our replacement string. So let's print out the Sparkle query at the end. All right, so then what we could do is test this, grab it, throw it over to the website, and see if it works. Yeah, it works. And so then pretty much the same thing we did last time is the same as this time. We just, you know, make the query, load the data, and then, you know, this, this code would probably even work too because it's the same labels and, and fields and values and stuff. Let's see if you indent it correctly. This stuff was extra. Yeah, okay. So that's kind of just a little, I think, because this is like, I think a common thing if you're, if you're going to be doing programming stuff with, with Wikidata, you might have a bunch of Q numbers that you want to pull out data. And so this is basically, um, you have to know exactly what you're looking for, though, with this Sparkle. You, you can't just say, hey, just give me everything you got. Like, I don't care, like, whatever, just send it over. Because you have to say, like, no, I want P106, which is occupation. So send that over. So another way of interacting with um, Wikidata is through its um, data endpoints. And so, for example, if you did have a bunch of Q numbers or you wanted to get information about a specific Q number, you can make an endpoint request to just that entity and pull back all the information about that entity. And so this is, um, if you're, let's, let's look at one of these cats again in the, in the results here. Let's look at um, Brigadier, Brigadier Broccoli. The famous soldier cat, right? So there's a lot of you know country citizenship, all these other things that were on this entity that did not really. Um, we would have to know exactly what you want. So if you're more of interested in just pulling back all the possible data, just so you can kind of get a sense of what's there, there are um, these special data endpoints um, that, or an, an endpoint that allows you to access these pieces of data as um, JSON. So if you knew exactly what the Q number was and you just wanted to pull back all of the data for that specific entity in JSON format, there is a um, endpoint where it's basically just um, special entity data slash the Q number and then dot JSON. So let's look at what this would look like for our, one of our cats, so Brigadier Broccoli. So I'm just gonna drop in Brigadier Broccoli's Q number into that URL pattern, and it will return uh, as, as JSON. So let's copy this uh, and throw it into our editor just to format it and see it. So this is basically the structure, and this kind of as informs you in how Wikidata is kind of storing their data. And so there's the entities, and then the Q number is the key of the um, the first key of the uh, request or of the ID you're looking for. Then it has metadata and then it has these labels. So these labels are the names in the different languages. Then it has the description, which is the same idea, but in different languages. Then we have claims. And so this is where all the P values are stored. So here's instance of, you know, we would find P106 where it'd be the um, occupation, etc. 
and it has um, the the problem is this with this kind of approach is that you don't get these labels right so you know that p106 is equivalent to q499 1371 but you don't know what q9994731 is you just know it's a wiki data item so you'd have to make another additional thing to go get it so you know this is a little bit more um code base right so you could actually you know have a dictionary before you start doing this and know that that q number means um soldier or whatever it means but if you wanted to actually just request data this way you could get all the claims and and have the results so let's just write a, a quick query to loop through the same um Q numbers that we had and try to pull out all the claims for them just to show you how it would work. Um, all right, so let's go back to our terminal. I'm going to copy that script we just made. I'm going to copy Sparkle IDs to um, data page.py. That's a pretty bad name. I'm going to move that from data page to data access.py. All right, so now data access is going to is going to we're going to work on this one, right? So now we know that the um, API endpoint is going to be different. It's basically just the endpoint that we've been using in the web browser, which is um, looks like this. So we know that the part that we're going to change is the queue number. So we'll just leave that up to there. And then we don't need to sparkle anymore because we're not working with sparkle anymore. We're going to keep these queue numbers. We don't care about prefixes anymore. Replacing strings and all that. Don't care. Uh, we don't care about parameters anymore because there's no parameters. Uh, it might be nice to keep the headers. That's fine. We'll delete the parameters. And then the stuff is the same. We'll drop the stuff out because it doesn't matter. All right, so now we have a bunch of queue numbers, and maybe we want to pull out all the data, all the claims for them for each um, individual queue number. So we'll say for queue num in queue numbers, and we'll indent all this underneath of there, so it will loop for each queue number. And so we need to build the URL, so we'll make a URL. Use URL equals URL plus the queue number plus dot json so it will look like um it will look like entity data slash q blah 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 dot json like it's supposed to look like and then um it's going to make the request and it's going to pull back the data and return it as data so let's print out each one of these let's see if it works Uh, data access. Um, all right, so we have a JSON encoding problem. So that when, when you see this JSON decoding error, it means it tried to turn. And you can see what error line it happened on, right? Line 18. So if we go to our code, line 18 is when we're trying to convert it. So what we can do is just print, print it first, print the results. Oh, and I can already see what the problem is, right? So we, we made a new URL here. And we put we're using this old URL up in our request, so we actually have to use the new URL. We're not that has the queue number in it and not the old one. That just is the template. All right, let's try it again. Okay, right. So it returns some data for each one, and this looks it will look exactly like the thing we just saw. Um, and this is not JSON, so it won't, it won't indent. It's just Python dictionary. But we know that there is the entities key, and then there is the queue number key, and then there's the data. So this might be um, kind of the first little hiccup for us because there's no permanent key name for the data, right? The key name is the queue number name. So if you have access to queue number, you could reference it, right? Um, otherwise, you might need to find a different approach to accessing it. So say we want to access the um, claims, which lives under entities, the queue number, and then claims. We would have to, we could do a couple of different ways, right? So we know that 
the Q number. We actually have the Q number in this case, so we know what to do. We could reuse it. Um, if you didn't have the Q number, you'd have to kind of pull out the keys of the dictionary and just pick the first one um, because that would be like the only key in the dictionary. Um, so you could, we could do it both ways. So if you wanted to get the Q number, um, or if we wanted to print it just knowing we had the Q number already, we could say, okay, print data, and it's in um, entities. Believe entities, and then it's in uh, the Q number. So we have the Q number here stored already with Q num, and then it's in claims. So let's see if that works. Yeah, right. There's P seventy. P854, etc. Right, and so the way you can get um, again, and then you wouldn't necessarily know how to what P numbers there are, right? Because you, you're asking for everything. So a way that you can get um, the keys of something is you can say um, so we'll say properties equals um, we're gonna say. This is a list of claims and we want to get the keys. So you can say keys, and then we want to turn that whole thing into a list. And so instead of printing out that for each one, let's print out the list of properties. All right, so now we know actually for each one of these, which property we have available. So this is the same process you would do if you didn't know the Q number. You could do the keys and then know which one, which key number or which Q number responds to that key. So for example, if we were just doing some analytics, right? This is, this is the common theme here. We could say all properties. And we'll say uh, for P in properties, and we'll say if p not in all properties, then all properties p equals uh, zero, and then all properties p plus one. So if we're just doing some analytics about, you know, what could you actually pull out of these pieces of, you know, for if we have all these different uh, elements or all these different key numbers, what could we actually get out of them? Um, if that didn't work, so let's look here. We want to print all the properties, not just the one. Right, so, you know, with a little analytics, we go through and say, like, oh, you know, it looks like, uh, you know, this is only three Q numbers, but, you know, P31 and P21 is pretty much always populated. So then we could say, okay, what is P21? And then go from there. So, you know, this is more of an approach if you have, like, hundreds or thousands or hundreds of thousands of Q numbers you want to do some work with. Um, if you're just kind of querying for certain data you don't know that exists, um, or you know it specifically exists, you can better off to use a Sparkle endpoint. But if you really want to get access to all the data for the um, uh, entity, you would use this, this data spe special data page. All right, so I think that brings us to an uh, end here. Let's end on... Digger Broccoli's um, page. And so this in this kind of video, we kind of looked at using the Sparkle endpoint using and using Python to interact with the Sparkle endpoint. So that's like a huge kind of opens up a big area of working with the Sparkle endpoint. Anything you can do in that query interface, you can now do in, in Sparkle in your Python script. So you could kind of use that as a step to combine multiple results. You could combine it with other data. You could use it to, you know, if you have a process that's returning Q numbers, then you could use that Q number and look up data in Wikidata, et cetera. So using these approaches, you should be able to access any kind of information in the Wikidata uh, in environment uh, and access it in your script. So thank you for watching, and I will talk to you later. Thanks. Bye.